Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. If you don't know who I am, my name is Allison and this is the Devotional Hearts Show. And today my guest is Father John Valadez. I discovered him by listening to every episode of his podcast, Eknekron, which I highly recommend. And we're gonna be talking about that today. And he has a zine called Death to the World. We're gonna be talking about that. Father Seraphim Rose. Um, St. Nectarios. We're going to get into a lot of really fun topics today, but first he's going to share his conversion story and let me welcome you officially. Thank you, Father John, for joining me today. And how are you doing? Thank you. I'm doing well. It's a blessing to uh, be talking with you. Well, let's get right into your story of how you became, first of all, an Orthodox Christian and then um, priest. Okay, well, um, I was uh, not raised in any kind of Christian household. Um, my parents, I, I had, I had two different homes because my, my parents were separated, um, but I didn't really have an, uh, a Christian upbringing at any, any of those homes. Um, I do remember a little bit my mom bringing me to some different Protestant churches here and there, but it's very spotty. There's nothing, no prayers at the table. There's no like consistent Christian upbringing or anything like that. Um, didn't really know really what scripture was. Um, sometimes we went like on Christmas or Easter. So I guess, you know, in the nineties, I guess that was a little bit typical um, still in some cases to have a somewhat kind of Christian upbringing um, in that sort of sense <clears throat> um, in America, um, but nothing consistent. Um, until I um, got into middle school, I made friends with a, a group that was already going to a Protestant youth group, and it was at a, at a Methodist church, and it wasn't a very uh, traditional youth group, but I, I I guess like traditional Methodist youth group. It was more like an evangelical Protestant youth group um, with a rock band and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's when I got really involved in Christian life and learning a little bit about Christianity and things like that. And um, when I got into high school, I was already attracted because of some of the friends that I had outside of the youth group, attracted to, uh, loud and hard music, uh, rock and roll and punk rock and hardcore music. And um, I made friends with a, a group of uh, punk rock kids uh, that were kind of the outcasts um, in, in high school. And one or two of them were involved in a Christian punk rock scene. There's a Protestant punk rock scene in uh, Southern California and started to invite me to shows and stuff like that. And, it, and that, was, um, that was really where I found a lot of inspiration as a Christian. And that's what really became uh, my community and my church um, in many ways. Um, almost every weekend we went to shows either at a church that, that um, hosted them or at some kind of uh, underground venue. And um, we would go and it'd be like a typical punk rock show um, with a mosh pit and crazy hair and all that kind of stuff. And, um, but with Christian lyrics. And then at the end of uh, the, that, and at the end of the concerts, they would break out their acoustic guitars and play um, Protestant worship songs. And um, so that was our, that was kind of our, that was really our church. Um, and we found a lot of meaning in it. And I think a lot of us came from really, you know, either broken homes or backgrounds um, with a lot of hard things that we were going through. And most of us were teenagers and young adults. And um, so we, we wanted a Christianity that was not of this world. Um, we felt, I think, like the Protestant dream and um, the materialistic life had failed us and failed our families and uh, Protestantism, um, it seemed, was soaking up that kind of uh, ethos. And so we wanted something that was real and had um, 
um, a rebellion against this world and um, has had the fervent uh, life that the apostles led and that kind of a thing. And a lot of these damn bands preach that, you know, they preached to be against this world. They, uh, they preached against the influence the world has upon us. Um, they preached against materialism. They preached against the corruption of the government and media and um, all that kind of stuff that can po poison the soul. Mm -hmm. And so it was really attractive. Um, and it really became a, 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 a huge part of my life and a pillar in my life. I don't know if I would have stayed a Christian through high school uh, without, without that scene. Mm -hmm. But eventually, you know, as I got uh, my, probably my junior, senior year in high school, the, the scene really started dwindling. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the bands moved away um, or broke up and shows weren't happening as often. And so a lot of the a lot of the community at that time was trying to find a, a, a venue or, 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 you know, something to retain this community. And so we, we did a lot of different things that we tried. We, we tried other kinds of shows. We tried to um, have a Bible study at the beach at a bonfire, you know, once a month, um, things like that. Um, we tried as much as we can to keep the community together, but I think the real big thing that, or the, yeah, the real big thing that we all found um, that kept us together together was um, a Bible study, a tattoo parlor um, where Father Tur now Father Turbo uh, was the tattoo artist and he hosted a Bible study for all of us um, before we converted. And um, a lot of the kids from this punk rock scene found their home um, at this Bible study. Um, we met every Monday night. We um, studied scripture from when the tattoo parlor closed at about 10 or 11 at night, and then sometimes stayed up talking and conversing about various things that either were going on in the world or that we found interesting in scripture or whatever it may be, um, sometimes until the sun came up the next day. Um, and so that became the substitute of this punk rock scene and I think took it a step further and one and and pushed a lot of us to search deeper into our Christian life and Father may I ask you a question mm -hmm. Father course. Turbo wasn't yet orthodox so what was what would you say the denomination was that he was teaching from like what perspective was it I don't know exactly. I think it was a true vine church that he came from. So a Protestant, you know, mm -hmm. a Protestant church. And so it was a very Protestant Bible study, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and when you had been in the punk rock scene, were you also studying the Bible during the week? Was that part of your Yeah, studying, studying scripture throughout the week and then we all had our various churches that we went to on Sundays. Oh, okay. You know, we just weren't really satisfied with them. Mm -hmm. um, but we knew that we needed to go. We just didn't really feel like it, it gave us enough, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, didn't answer the questions that we were asking, you know. And questions. I'm just, this is kind of off the subject, but I'm just really curious. Were you friends with secular punk rockers and did you ever invite them to the christian scene like was anybody interested who wasn't a christian or, or did you even try to invite anybody yeah definitely um a lot of the kids that we hung out at school in our group were were secular um uh, punk rockers that went to different shows and I went to different shows too. I didn't just go to the Christian shows, but I did go to the Christian shows the mostly. Um, later when the scene started to kind of dwindle and fall apart, some of the bands that, that only played with Christian bands, you know, had to start playing with other secular bands and stuff like that. So at the end, we did have a lot of shows that were like intermingled, you know, mixed together. And sometimes there was a lot of, um, animosity towards the Christians that were there. Oh. Um, 
and sometimes it was a good thing and it reached out to people and helped kids, you know, but, um, but yeah, so I, I think that the, the Christian scene did suck a lot of, um, of sincere, sincerely searching um, secular kids that were already engaged in this kind of subculture and music into it. Um, I mean, I certainly probably would have gone a secular route with this secular music if it wasn't for um, the Christian scene itself that I found. So, yeah. So yeah, it was, it, it was something that I think a lot of us took for granted. And you look back on it now and see that God really was using it to inspire um, a lot of us. Mm. And um, it, what's interesting, you know, that is that later when we started looking into orthodoxy, um, one of the first books I read was a uh, Frederica Matthews Green book um, called Facing East, I think. And she had mentioned Death to the World and Youth of the Apocalypse and things like that. And I emailed her and she forwarded my email to the abbot of St. Herman Monastery, who's now Bishop Grossom in Texas. Hmm. He was the abbot there at the time. And he sent me a box full of Death to the World uh, magazines, old ones from the 90s, and um, You Have the Apocalypse books. And um, our group of friends uh, who were looking into Orthodoxy too remembered that these bands that we were listening to, they took a lot of their lyrics and their slogans from these old Death to the Worlds that they had got a hold of in the 90s. And so a lot of the inspiration from this whole scene was actually orthodox um, behind the scenes. They just didn't want, you know, people to know about this Roman Catholic stuff that they thought, <laughs> you know, saints and the Virgin Mary and things like that. And so I actually had a friend who, one of these bands uh, who was really popular in the scene. Um, now they actually got back together and are playing again, which is interesting, but when they moved out of Southern California, they left him this file cabinet full of uh, lyrics and all kinds of stuff that they were yeah. using. And in that file cabinet was a bunch of Death to the World magazines with highlights in them of lyrics that they had taken from. And one of the Youth of the Apocalypse, uh, in, in one of the chapters of the Youth of the Apocalypse is like word for word at the beginning of the chapter is one of these songs you know wow. that so so everything that we were really attracted to at least i was really attracted to in this scene was actually just all orthodox it was all there um just we weren't told what the orthodox church mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. um so while we we're at this um this uh, tattoo parlor bible study <clears throat> we are all looking for a more traditional christianity um, probably not in the sense of what we ended up falling into, um, but in the sense of um, a Christianity that was otherworldly, um, that was like the Acts of the Apostles um, that you read about and the, the fervent um, lives of the early Christian martyrs, you know, things like that. And um, I didn't know it, uh, but Father Turbo was on a real a uh, big spiritual um, journey and a search because he had run into some orthodox things and been inspired and um, started a whole snowball of searching. And um, one day, kind of abruptly, um, in, my, in my point of view, it was abrupt because I didn't know what was going on behind the scenes. But for people who knew what was going on, it was, it was something that they saw coming at some point. But um, Father Turbo um, decided to become Orthodox with his family. And so he ended the Bible study as a, you know, he said, you know, in, in respect of other people's pastors and uh, things like that. And he said, he's, he's going to become Orthodox. I'll never forget it. It was the last Bible study he gave uh, was a Bible study on, um, on how Satan can disguise himself as an angel and deceive uh, people. And, uh, he talked about um, Martin Luther and he talked about how we can think that we're in the right place, but 
um, deception is something that we should always uh, be questioning or um, and how God never blesses rebellion and Martin Luther was in rebellion and um, things like that. And um, so the so the Bible study ended and he called us back uh, the next week or two weeks later for anybody who wanted to come and kind of hear about and, and, and him to explain, you know, why he decided to do what he did. Uh, and so we all came and he laid it all out for us on his whole journey, what had happened um, leading up to these events and why he was choosing to become Orthodox. And I didn't really know what to think about it. I had never heard Orthodox before, the word Orthodox before. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, you know, not Orthodox Christianity um, before. And I went home trying to find everything I could uh, out about Orthodoxy. And at that time, it was hard on the internet. There wasn't a ton. Yeah. And, but I did see that, like, you know, it had this uh, all this, uh, you know, scary Catholic stuff of praying to saints and kissing things and the Virgin Mary and, yeah. you know, so I, like, I, you know, I trust Turbo. He's, he, you know, he's at that time, like, I'm, tr I trust Turbo. He said, he, he, he loves God. Like, but what is all this stuff, you know, what is all this stuff that he's getting into? And Was there an Orthodox church near you that you were able to go to and yeah um later later on uh, i ended up just visiting where he was going which was really close to my house um, a little further for him for him but really close to my house um during that time of his conversion i became his apprentice at the tattoo parlor and um, i started doing that right before he ended the bible study and gave this whole announcement you know so I didn't know what I was getting myself into, um, becoming his apprentice. And, um, we, um, but we, we, um, talked about orthodoxy. We talked about, um, things that were going on in the world, um, during the time of my apprenticeship. And I really started searching, uh, for it a lot. And that's when I ran into that book by Frederica. Uh, I went, to like the local library and found like the orthodox section that was like this big yeah. like five books <laughs> <laughs> so i checked out like half of them you know and tried to figure out what was going on and mm -hmm. um but once i got the debts of the world magazines and once that all came to light that everything that had inspired me uh before and kept me christian really yeah. uh was all orthodox stuff mm -hmm. um then that really um, was the huge turning point for me. Mm. Um, and uh, I was in communication with, uh, with Bishop Grossom, who, like I said, was the abbot at that time, just Father Grossom up there. And he directed me to go to a parish, which was the same parish Turbo was going to, uh, Father Turbo was going to. And, um, you know, when I first went, you know, a lot of people say, I don't know. I don't know how your um, experience was in walking into a liturgy, but um, a lot of people say, you know, when I went to liturgy for the first time, I felt like I was at home, yeah. you know, or I felt like I was inspired, and that really wasn't my um, experience. Oh, um, I I actually was n not really. I actually um, didn't really feel like this is something that I liked. Um, but at the same time, I knew that it was the truth mm. by that time. Wow. You know? And um, living, you know, with having this like punk rock ethos ingrained in me since, you know, I was a young teen and going and listening to music and going to shows, truth was absolute in my mind. And truth was something that we should sacrifice, that people should sacrifice everything for. Yeah. Um, and so I knew by that time that orthodoxy was the truth. Mm -hmm. And so to me, um, it didn't really matter whether I liked it or not, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and I had to change myself for it um, if it was real. 
Uh, and I got to a point really where, and I think a lot of people got to the point, at least in our, our tattoo Bible study, got to the point really where if orthodoxy isn't real and it is the truth, then we don't know who Jesus Christ is and maybe his church doesn't exist anymore. You know, we kind of got to that point. So disillusioned with Protestantism and uncovering all this history um, that we uncovered, there was just no going back. If orthodoxy wasn't it, then we didn't know what we were going to do with our faith anymore. Um, and a lot of people, uh, the, the tattoo parlor, you know, I think Father Turbo would say the same thing. The tattoo parlor Bible study was uh, a, a real big uh, make it or break it for, for a lot of people. Um, uh, about 30 people came in and were baptized with us um, mm -hmm. at a tattoo shop wow. and about 25 the next year. Mm -hmm. um, and then people trickled in after that. Um, but people who didn't choose to be Orthodox or ended up leaving orthodoxy shortly after because they weren't really ready for w the spiritual seriousness i think that that it requires um you know it, mo a lot of them lost their faith or went a different a totally different way um so it was really a make it or break it for a lot of us um but that's how i became orthodox i, I father Tur father turbo it's all father turbo's fault basically <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for anyone new to my channel i just want to remind everybody everybody who's watching that we i have an interview with father turbo it's currently my featured interview on my channel it was i saw that yeah it was from um february i want to say something like that but um it's one of the best episodes yeah of yeah. my whole show. So I encourage everybody to watch it or rewatch it if you've already watched it. <laughs> so how, so from the time you were baptized till you realized you wanted to be a priest, how long was that? And how, how did that come about that you knew you wanted to serve as a priest? It, it was a little over um, 10 years. Oh, so so I was received um, in 2000, 2006, yeah, 2006 um, on Lazarus Saturday uh, with Father Turbo, um, and um, this I was I was I, I had just turned twenty, um, so I became a catechumen at around at eighteen, almost nineteen, and um, so. During that time of the catechumenate, um, I was visiting the monastery very often, um, Platina, the monastery in Platina, very often. And we were getting Death of the World magazines and we were um, copying them, printing them, and um, giving them out at different punk rock shows. Um, and we wanted the monks to, to um, maybe put out new issues, you know, and the the monks they didn't really have the time um to to work on it so they gave us a blessing after we were baptized to start compiling issues and then sending them to the monks to be proofread and then we'd print them and hand them out mm -hmm. and um so we went to a few different uh christian rock festivals like cornerstone festival um and and things like that. And so I think that's really where, where it ignited me, uh, like a like a desire in me to serve the church um, in some kind of capacity. I just didn't know really what the capacity was. I kind of dabbled in maybe going into going and becoming a monk in a monastery. Um, I spent I spent um, some chunks of time up at the monastery on Spruce Island in Alaska, just mm -hmm. kind of testing it out and seeing you know, where God would lead me. I didn't really know where. I didn't really have a lot of direction. Um, I don't think either. Um, my compass was just kind of going everywhere as a young adult. Um, and uh, with, especially without any Christian foundation while I was a kid, you know. So I think I was really on training wheels trying to learn uh, what what exactly to do and um, with my life. And um, in about 2000 and... Um, 
in 2011, 2010, um, I met my, I met my now who is my wife, Presbyterian Christina, and uh, we got married a few years later. And uh, what, but I was thinking at that time, like maybe I should, maybe I can go into the priesthood, or maybe I should could go into the clergy, or serve the church in that in some kind of way. Um, I was working different jobs, but none of them were really satisfying. <clears throat> um, and she told me, um, if you want to. If you want to, um, you know, become a priest, maybe. Here, hang on one second. Okay. <laughs> so, sorry, one of my kids was trying to come in. That's okay. Um, so, um, you know, we, we were, we were dating at the time. Um, she was like really hesitant. I don't know if I should date you if you want to become a priest. That's all. That's a big commitment, you know? Um, uh, but then uh, after a few years uh, of thinking about it, we, we um, decided to ask our spiritual father what we should do and um, if it would be a good idea. And um, so in 2015, we, I think it was 2015, um, we started really seriously thinking about it and uh, putting in our, our um, applications and stuff. And uh, the diocese, the archdiocese, uh, I'm in the Antiochian archdiocese, they, they send us over to St. Vladimir Seminary. And um, we, we did our, our sentence there, I guess, for three years. <laughs> and then, <laughs> then we're put, you know, then we were put here in Lompoc. Uh, it became our first, our first um, parish that we were assigned to. So I would love to talk a little bit more about spiritual discernment. That was something we touched on a little bit earlier and rebelliousness. And what are some things you can share for my audience about that? Um, well, you know, I, I, I think I had to learn a lot when I became Orthodox because my whole outlook on the world was an outlook of rebellion. Mm -hmm. And in the punk rock scene, um, and even in that Protestant punk rock scene, the, the rebellion was always against what the world is doing. You know, it was always pointing fingers. Mm -hmm. Like the world is evil these politicians are evil, media is evil, you know, um, it was always pointing fingers. So it reinforced this rebellious attitude. And in some ways it was very good um, in that I didn't know anything better. And so it preserved me in a lot of ways, you know, like I didn't watch, um, I didn't watch TV or media because of a lot of that stuff. Um, I didn't eat certain things or support certain kinds of restaurants or businesses because of that kind of stuff and so there was a type of asceticism that kind of went into it without knowing what that really was um but um i remember when i first became orthodox listening to a lecture from father seraphim rose um, i think it's orthodox worldview the orthodox worldview and he says in there something about those who find orthodoxy from a rock and roll subculture uh, will uh, have a lot of learning to do uh, before they come to realize what orthodoxy truly is. You know, now I'm paraphrasing, but it's something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And at first listening to that, I was like, oh, maybe he doesn't really know what, you know, like, you know, what it really is or, you know, um, but later now looking back, um, he is a hundred, he was a hundred percent dead on right. Mm -hmm. Because what I had to learn was that, and what I had to discern was that um, the rebellion really isn't so much on the outside. Like every, th all this stuff is evil, you know, uh, which it's good to discern and recognize that mm -hmm. kind of thing. But really what had to happen was that I had to say, look at all this, all these parts of the world that are in myself. Yeah. Right. And where is the evil in myself? Mm. And 
it was really easy to point at everything else. Mm -hmm. And it was really hard to say, to say, no, a lot of that stuff exists in me too. Yeah. Right. And to try to root that out and, um, death to the world played a good part in that because I think, um, a lot of the issues uh, that the monks put together in the 90s were trying to get that uh, line across, you know, that message across. And um, I really uh, had to learn how to start rebelling against my old self rather than everything outside of myself. Oh my gosh, know? that's huge. That <laughs> so so awesome. Father Seraphim was totally right, 100%. Mm. There was a lot of learning to do. A lot of learning to do. So well, what you just said is such a huge and important topic. And I it's something I think about a lot because for me, the church is my hospital where I'm going to heal mm -hmm. my my sins, my all the mistakes I've made in my whole life. I'm now going to be doing my life confession and then mm -hmm. I will have a spiritual confessor and be doing the prayers and the life of an Orthodox Christian to help heal myself. And, and I looked for healing in new age spirituality, drinking ayahuasca, doing Hindu practices and yoga, you know, chanting to the Hindu gods and I, my intention was there, you know, I think I had a good intention, but then when I found orthodoxy, it was like, okay, this is, this is it. This is for me. I know this is for me, but it's so hard because it's so much self-responsibility and yeah. admitting how flawed I am instead of glorifying myself as a goddess, you know, now mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking at what a sinner I am and how I've hurt people and hurt myself and turned away from God. And so have you found that people coming to orthodoxy, they're attracted to reading orthodoxy and the religion of the future. And, you know, all the similarities from some of the new age things like the mysticism is really attractive. The the visual beauty of the church and our liturgies and things. But when it comes down to the work, <laughs> the ascetic <laughs> life, and really not just repenting, but really making a commitment not to continue sinning and being discerning of the logismi and all mm. the work that it takes, have you found that it, it can be really hard because it is, it's hard. It's a harder path than anything yeah. I've ever done because everything I did before was just what felt good and what was fun and was pretty and was easy. And this path is a lot of work. So right. what would you say about that? All right. I think you're, you're, you're really spot on, you know, and um, unfortunately some of the uh, friends that we had um, that did convert with us or baptize with us, that did fall away from the church, I think. And, and, and as a priest seeing, seeing either catechumens not follow through or mm -hmm. people after they're baptized, not 100% follow through mm -hmm. and fall away after a few years. I think that's the underlying factor is that um, there's a lot of beauty. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff that attracts people to the church, you know, mm -hmm. the beauty of it. Um, sometimes the um the more academic heady part of it you know like having the scholastic part of it you know the depth of the, the theology mm -hmm. the philosophy of it the the correct having the correct uh faith the correct history you know all that kind of stuff is so attractive to have this absolute um and um but at the same time actually living it out and embodying it becomes something entirely different. Um, and it, ha and it, and it is a struggle, Yeah, but it's a good, it's a good struggle because mm -hmm. without all of that, you know, St. Joseph, the Hesychist, and, and he's, and he quoted saying this, he quoted many of the other fathers, um, you know, with uh, shed blood, receive the spirit, you know, it's not without, uh, yeah dying to ourselves without slaying ourselves that we receive grace that we receive um the reality of what it is to be 
um, an Orthodox Christian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think you're definitely right on. Uh, the church is attractive a lot of ways on the outside and on the inside, um, but to live it is something entirely different. I think St. Silouan talked about that. He talked about um, knowing about God. There's a lot of people that know about God, um, but it's a, it's a totally uh, different thing to actually know him, mm -hmm. right? And, and another thing about orthodoxy is the struggling with the passions and mm -hmm. learning how to catch a thought that is that comes from one of our passions and do we go with that and justify a sinful behavior that's connected with that thought like ooh that's that would be fun that but it's like really bad for your spiritual life to go and do right. that and and this this work of awareness of the passions and i mean i don't think i don't know anything about western christianity cuz i was never a christian mm -hmm. but um from what I know, I don't think the Protestants put a lot of focus on catching our, our like struggling with the passions. And is that, am I correct? Yeah, I, I, I think you're, you're correct, at least, you know, um, on a popular sense, there might be a church here or there that does that kind of a stuff, does that stuff uh, to some degree, but um, on, in a, on, a, on a popular level, there's a lack of awareness in, in Western Christianity in general. Um, there's a lack of awareness. I, I think that is mainly due to, um, in Roman Catholicism, due to the decline of monasticism, uh, particularly in the United States after Vatican II, they had their monastic population was just absolutely decimated, um, absolutely decimated. Um, from, and, and then you saw everything become secularized from the hospitals to their schools. And so the lack of an ascetic life um, around them um, and, and the lack of ascetic practice, you know, um, has led to this lack of self-awareness and what asceticism is. And so in the West in general, you kind of have this um, lack of understanding the human person and where where thoughts come from how do we battle the passions what the passions even are mm -hmm. right um and that discernment is kind of has become this um i guess this old and hidden uh wisdom you know the church still still preserves so yeah that that's something that we hold as uh, a great treasure you know, within, within our faith. And Father Seraphim talks about it in that orthodoxy and religion of the future. You know, he uses mm -hmm. that term prelist, which is not being able to discern where we're at spiritually and, and reaching for a higher spiritual state or thinking we're in a higher spiritual state than we actually are. Mm -hmm. And that how the West has lost this concept of prelist and how, why you have all these false miracles and other kind of weird things happening in the mm -hmm. lives of you know, so-called saints in the West um, and um, how things are accepted and, and just really kind of odd and, and strange. And when we look at the lives of Orthodox saints, you know, um, so it, it's a beautiful thing that we possess, um, that we have uh, this, our, the richness of the ascetic life and, and um, having so many modern saints, being able to communicate that to us it's wonderful. You know, we've canonized over the last 20 years, 30 years, we've canonized some of the most beautiful saints in the 2000 years of our church. Yeah. Um, these men and women who lived in modern times and able to, I guess, tune into the frequency of the ancient fathers and communicate it mm -hmm. to um, modern people, you know, yeah. so with the, with the thoughts, for instance, I just love St. Paisios, you know, he, he, he talks about the, our, our, our mind being like, uh, like an airport, you know, and there's all these thoughts, uh, flying around calling into land, you know, mm -hmm. and how, uh, we have to be discerning of what we let land mm -hmm. and what we don't let land. And so it's just great how, how we have these saints that are able to communicate the ancient wisdom of, 
St. Macarius the Great, St. Anthony the Great, you know, these ascetics in the very early, early stages of monasticism, you know, we have saints in the 90s uh, talking about it in terms of airports and, and radios and, you know, things like that, that we, so we can understand them better, you know, so it's wonderful. It's a wonderful thing that we still have that stuff. And I love that you chose the Orthodox Survival Course for your lecture series. I loved it. I couldn't stop listening to your <laughs> podcast um, pretty much every day. I try to take a walk in nature every day. And oh, nice. so I was listening to that. And um, you, you're you such a um, natural teacher and the, the material the way you express the material was just so good. I mean, so to the point, you didn't ramble, you know, <laughs> like every, every <laughs> section of the podcast has something really, really useful, practical, you know, and um, can you speak a little bit more about Father Seraphim Rose and why you chose that particular topic for that lecture series? Well, first I'll say that I'm really not an actual speaker. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was I was ordained a deacon on the on the feast of Saint John Chrysostom, and my, you know, the bishop told me, you know, you really need to work on your homilies and teaching. That's what you're going to be doing, you know. And so whenever something comes out good, I just attribute it to Saint John Chrysostom's help. You know, the golden mouth gave me just oh. a little bit of wisdom to. <laughs> To, to bring out, you know. Um, so, um, but with Father Sarah from Survival Course, I was really drawn to it, um, it especially because of COVID times mm -hmm. um, and everything that was happening during that whole um, season of things. And um, he, I think it's a really, really valuable work that many. Uh, Christians, especially in the West and in America, should be aware of. Um, he traces the downfall and the decline of Western society mm -hmm. from the time of the schism um, until um, until the the seventies, eighties when he when he was living. And um, he goes through all different kinds of philosophical movements, um, political movements. Um, he goes through um, you know the different uh, cults that that happened and sprung up around uh, these different movements and also the um, um, you know the different like the UFO phenomenons and scientific mm -hmm. the rise of scientism and things like that um, in the 50s 60s 70s and it it really takes history and it puts it in a spiritual perspective yeah you know the west had this grace of the church and then with its divorce from orthodoxy, lost that grace and little by little started to uh, dabble in the ways of the world and the philosophies of this world and lost um, its course, you know, um, and really started to spin out, especially when you get into the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, um, really things start to really go down uh, pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, and so he does a good job at giving us as Westerners aware, an awareness of our roots and what happened to us and why we find ourselves in where, where we're at now. You know, it's not like some accident out of nowhere. You know, the world is just in complete chaos. You know, this, there's this huge spiritual component that has been working in the world and you know, Father Seraphim, you know, one of his quotes that I think is really good and also brings a lot of, a lot of um, sobriety, especially if we think Christianity should have its home in this world, is that, you know, he said that um, at the time of Christ, the world could not accept him. Um, they, it could only accept Antichrist, and the same thing is now. Mm. You know, if Christ appeared now, they'd crucify him just as they did before. Yeah. And it only can ex accept Antichrist. Um, so when we see, you know, um, certain figures, even figures in the church, rubbing their, you know, shoulders with certain kinds of politicians and 
making um, orthodoxy at home in this world, um, then we have to really question like, what is going on, um, you know, here? And is, is, is this what the church is for? And are we being otherworldly, you know, or are we making ourselves at home here? Are we, are we um, compromising some of our faith to have the luxury of uh, political um, protection or, uh, you know, a comfortability in this world or whatever it may be, you know, or giving something up for that. And Father Seraphim just does such a good job in that course, giving us a well-rounded view from a spiritual perspective of how things got to where they are now, um, putting us face to face with who we truly are as Western people and as modern Americans and um, what, the, what the true you know, way to turn all of this around and, and the true way to, you know, realize who, who we truly should become and who we are created to be. And that's by becoming an Orthodox Christian, right. And to practice um, the faith and um, to, to study the lives of these um, holy ascetics and, and saints um, of our time and times of the past, you know, that have dealt with the world when it was in chaos and as it's going into chaos. So, so that's why I was really attracted to him. Um, and mm-hmm. well, it's particularly that work in general, you know, he is such a phenomenal figure, uh, Truly. especially yeah. anybody who's like raised in, in America and particularly anybody raised in Southern California, you know, um, he only, he was born, you know, not very far from where I grew up as a kid and, not very far. He went to college, not very far from where, where I went to high school. And, um, even though they're totally different time periods, um, it's still like, you have this sense of, um, you know, uh, being, um, somewhat able to understand what he went through his whole yeah. life because you, you're familiar with it. Yeah. Um, I really what one of the first orthodox books I read was orthodoxy and the religion of the future and I think it's so for a lot of my audience as well Mm -hmm. and we were for myself at least I was searching as I said earlier with Mm -hmm. through Hindu you know all the different religions except for Christianity you know I didn't read the bible (laughs) Mm -hmm. But I was interested in Tibetan Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, Hinduism, and all those things. And so he studied with Alan Watts, I think, too, right, in San Francisco. And I'm pretty familiar with Alan Watts. And um, so, yeah, I think he's one of our generation's favorite Orthodox writers. Yeah. And then... um, St. Nectarios has become very well known with this movie that just came out for the new people like myself. I didn't know anything about him until I learned about him from your podcast. And then I saw Man of God. So can you tell us a little bit about him and why you talk about him on your podcast? Yeah, um, I I really love St. Nectarios um, just within the past few years, um, especially as a priest. Um, I've really grown to have a great relationship uh, with him. Uh, particularly, there was a, um, a, an older gentleman who had cancer in our parish um, mm-hmm. in his neck. And we, um, I don't know if you know, but in, in, in Southern California, we have the largest relic of St. Nectarios outside of Greece. Oh, no, I didn't know that. Um, and uh, so there's a shrine for him. Uh, shrine of saint nectarios in cabina it's in la mm. and uh they they give little vials of oil that burn in the lamp um in front of uh that relic and give them out to people and so um we got a or i got some oil from that and gave it to him and he anointed himself all every day um and he went through the different radiation therapies and stuff but his cancer went away very quickly and it hasn't come back yet. And oh, praise God. And he really attributes that to St. Nectarios in the way that mm. um, it had disappeared. And 
and things like that and hasn't come back. And so I really, you know, uh, especially after that incident, really started looking into his life more. And, you know, I didn't, I actually didn't know much about him when I was, when I, when I became Orthodox and when I was first Orthodox and my, my son, my oldest son, Maximus was actually born on his feast day. Oh, uh, wow. Cool. Yeah. In November. And we probably would have named him Nectarios had he been born like now, you know, now, now that I know more about him, uh, say Nectarios. So, you know, he's, he's, um, he's, he's been great to our family in, in that sense too, you know, having that familiarity with our son being born, his feast. Um, but within the past year or two, there have been a good amount of translations that have come out from his works. Mm -hmm. uh, New Run Press puts, has a few books um, from him out and um, you know, one is called Habitation to Holiness. That's um, a good swath of his writings. Um, and, uh, you know, he teaches on what the church is, what the priesthood is and um, things like that in that book. Um, San Nectarios Monastery in, in um, New York, in Northern New York, uh, he, they, they, they put out uh, uh, one on confession and a few other things like on evolutionism. I think there's one like that from them. And a few others um, from him, like small pamphlet ones. But um, there's another press that um, my friend, Joseph Calendario, he helped translate some of his other works on like morals and ethics and things like that. So a lot like within the past two or three years has come out from him um, that we can read now in English. And I think that he is such a great figure because not only is he a great teacher and God knows we need <laughs> all the great teachers we can uh, have. Um, he, he was combating a lot of things during his day, you know, and as you saw in the movie, the very obvious one is that he was persecuted and slandered and from, you know, all his, his entire life. And it followed him. These lies followed him entire, his entire life. So many friends turned their backs on him. Um, he was put through such um, a crucible with all this, all this stuff that happened around him and to him in his life. And he took everything with, with, uh, with patience and with grace. And rarely ever did he stand up for himself. Um, he took everything as God's will. He never threw things back into people's faces. He never tried to justify his name mostly it was people who loved him and knew who he truly was or who, yeah, who he truly was, um, are the people who, who, who stood up for him, you know, um, and, and cleared his name later. But, um, even, even after his death, he, the, I, I was told this by the priest over there, uh, at the shrine. Um, cause after we did that lecture series on Senectarius, we, we took a pilgrimage to the parish and we went over to the shrine and uh, the priest was telling me that even at, at his death, on his deathbed, and after his death, the church, the churches of the city wouldn't even open their doors for him to be, to have a funeral. Mm -hmm. And so he was buried kind of in this humble way outside of the city. Um, then, of course, his relics later, when they exhumed them to bring them to the monastery, were found to be incorrupt and fragrant. And um, so he's such a wonderful and beautiful um, saint. He also, you know, during that time, there were so many Protestant missionaries coming into Greece, and um, um, you know, they, they were they were spreading, of course, um, false doctrine and uh, leading the faithful astray and tempting them with um, certain kinds of ideas. Mm -hmm. And so he also wrote so many things um, against Protestantism and uh, trying to turn around at his time there was kind of a poor catechism not only just among amongst the clergy but especially amongst the laity mm -hmm. and so he took very hard theological concepts and he put them into uh, i think simple simple words that people could understand mm -hmm. and um he wasn't a person that was um you know um that distanced himself from the people um as you as, as you saw in the movie, Man of God, you know, he's very much uh, a man of the people, right? And a true shepherd that moves among his flock. And so there's just so many things about his life that 
are wonderful and awe inspiring and become great examples for us today. Yeah, that's awesome. So we have a couple minutes left. I wanted to talk a little bit about Platina, Spruce Island. The when people are becoming baptized, you know, or certain they want to be Orthodox Christians, I hear a lot of the older um, Orthodox Christians encouraging the new people to visit a monastery at least once. Um, I haven't been able to do that yet, but I really want to. So what are some of the benefits of visiting a monastery? What is it like, or what do you do when you go there? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that um, it's absolutely um, important. You know, it's, it's one of the things that we should absolutely do as Orthodox Christians to make regular pilgrimages uh, to monasteries, mm -hmm. um, because there we see a uh, the the real uh, a real fervency for the gospel and for orthodoxy lived out mm. um, in a way that we don't see it typically in the parish, um, and this kind of um, relationship between the parish life and the monastery has always been. You know, sometimes it 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 has created tension. Other times, you know, it has not created tension. But it's a great um, a healthy. Uh, way in which we see um, how uh, the faith can be lived out to a, the very farthest extent that it can, you know, and embodied in a community um, in a way that we don't typically see every day. You know, it, it, um, the monasteries, uh, it, in the beginning, ever since the beginning, they became, the monks became the living martyrs, you know, so when martyrdom stopped um, in the Roman Empire, you had um, Christianity become a little bit more comfortable in this world, right? We were able to build churches uh, and go and worship in the open. Um, and uh, even later, you know, the, the Christians taking political offices and emperors being Christians. And um, so orthodoxy became very um, at home, I guess, in this world, not necessarily always in a bad way, but um, that fervency of the martyrs and the uh, knowledge that if you went to church, you might be arrested and tortured, you know, for going. Um, the, all that stuff kind of uh, started to, to um, evaporate. And so the ascetics, the, the men and the women that went out into these deserts and founded these communities, you know, they... They didn't actually go out into the wilderness to live a more quiet life. Um, they didn't actually uproot themselves to go out there and say, you know, oh, it's peaceful in, in nature and I don't have to be in the city and um, I can pray to God more out here and that kind of a thing. Um, the desert back then was typically viewed as the place where the demons dwelt yeah. and where the unknown was. Mm -hmm. And so St. Anthony and St. Macarius the Gray, St. Pacomios, all these wonderful ascetics and desert fathers and mothers went out, is, went out uh, with a mission to conquer the devil mm -hmm. and to conquer the passions and to take everything like head on to the extreme. And so they became these living uh, martyrs, this example of a really extreme and um, fervent faith, right? And because they did that, and because they conquered their passions, now they're filled with the grace of God and able to give that grace to other people and to help them to live um, their own life, right? And so uh, the, that's what the monastery, that's why they're such a treasure, is because they still preserve that kind of an attitude. And so wonderful. There's so many wonderful monasteries that we have um, in America. And, you know, we visit very often, my family and I and people from our parish, we visit um, Life Giving Spring. It's a convent in Dunlop, California. And um, the eldress, uh, Yerandisa uh, Markella, who's there, um, she's, she's a living saint. She really is a living saint. And um, it's wonderful to see a glimpse of what sainthood looks like you know, and what the faith looks like lived out. 
um, in simplicity and in love and um, able to kind of soak some of that up, right? And take it with us back to the parish and um, go when we need to draw that water again, you know? <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. So to close, something you said earlier really struck me and I wondered if you could just give my audience some guidance on this. You said that we should be, stri we should be striving and sacrificing for truth in our lives. So yeah. what does that look like and how can we do that? Um, well, I think, you know, one of Father Seraphim's, um, another, uh, you know, Father Seraphim quote is that he, you know, when, when he realized that truth is a person, right, who is Christ, that's when he really found home. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when we sacrifice for what is truth, we sacrifice for a person, not like an idea, mm -hmm. not, not some kind of philosophy, right? We sacrifice for a person who is Christ. Christ is the truth. And so everything that we might stand for, um, any kind of ideologies that we might hold, um, all of that, especially when we come into the church, has to be crucified so that we can, uh, so that it can be resurrected with Christ, who is truth. Wow. And so Father Seraphim, he, he talked about how he had to do the same thing. I mean, you've, you've read parts of his life, you know, you know what kind of a person he was. He was absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Um, absolutely brilliant, right? And just reading things in, in their original language. He was just absolutely, you know, 100% looking for and searching for what was real. And um, he, needed, he, he, he needed to crucify his mind, he said, mm -hmm. in order for it to be reborn um, in the light of Christ, in the light of living truth, and in the light of... Um, of all the saints that had gone before him, you know, so this world will always, you know, offer us uh, all kinds of um, various ideologies and religions and uh, ways to believe and um, all sorts of, uh, of different things that can be really, that can look really appetizing. And um, in the end, they, they really just all give us death. You know, they don't give us anything that it, that goes beyond what is transient. And so Christ is the only one who rose from the dead, right? He's the only one who, who um, is a, a God that um, came to dwell among his people, to touch his creation, to bend down low and to walk amidst the people that he loved, uh, that he loves, that he wanted to save and does save. So Christ is the, the absolute truth and the life and uh, everything that we sacrifice for truth is uh, a sacrifice for Christ. And so we talked about your podcast, which I will link in the description and the website where people can buy Death to the World magazine. And then you also have a website where you post blog articles, correct? Yeah, there's a, well, there's the Death to the World site, which has uh, blog stuff on it. Um, we also have an Instagram. We have a Facebook, but I'm not really on Facebook. It just mm -hmm. posts from my Instagram. Um, and then we just started a Patreon page uh, where we'll post um, the podcasts early on there. And there's different tiers um, uh, for artwork, for you know, subscription to the magazine, things like that, different tiers on the Patreon for all that kind of stuff. If and you sell t-shirts and sweatshirts too, right? Yeah, we sell t-shirts um, right now. We're kind of in a transition. My family and I moved to a, a little bit of a smaller house, but on some land outside of town. And so 
uh, the, the small room that we have for death to the world stuff, uh, we can't keep a bunch of stuff stocked. So there's not a lot of stock on the store right now, but, um, we're expanding, um, the room and stuff so that we could, so that we could have more stock on there. Mm. Um, one thing that's exciting is that we have all of the old death to the world. So the stuff that was cut and copied, uh, and pasted together by the monks in the nineties. We have all those originals and we had them all professionally scanned. So um, the next few weeks to a month or so, we'll be releasing um, issues one through five again. Um, they haven't seen the light of day in their physical form in quite some time, wow. probably like 15 years, um, maybe a little less than that, but um, it's exciting. So we'll have yeah. those up for people to to get and, and keep those in stock. And we're going to work on getting five through 10 and then 10, then 11 through or, or six through 10 and then 11 through 15 and, and have all of the old stuff um, available again. So that's really exciting. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you, Father John. This has been so much fun. I learned so much from you and I just really appreciate all the work you're doing. And I'm always Looking for the next Ecnecron episode to come out. <laughs> Thank God. Thank you so much. Yeah, they're, <laughs> it's wonderful because they they are um, kind of, they're recordings really of our ongoing catechism at our parish. So mm -hmm. every Wednesday night we do some sort of uh, a teaching, you know. So many times it's a lecture series, and um, so so those are posted up when when I am able to um, edit them and upload. Awesome. Yeah. Well, to my audience, thank you so much for watching. If this was enjoyable and you can think of someone you'd like to share it with, that would really touch my heart and all your comments. Of course, I always love to read them. Please leave a kind comment for my guest, Father John. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Follow me on Instagram. I'm at a devotional heart. I am a Christian women's life coach. I help with relationships, femininity, and online business. And Father John, would you close with a blessing for my audience, please? Of course. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, it is truly me to bless thee, the Theotokos, ever blessed and all blameless, and Mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, and beyond compare, more glorious than the seraphim, who without corruption gave us birth to God the Word, and our truly Theotokos, thee to be magnified. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. Indeed, he is risen. Please give my regards to your family, and I hope one day I can visit Lompoc and attend your divine liturgy. Yes, please do. Please <laughs> do. It will be a blessing to have you, and thank you for having me on. Oh, thank you again, Father. All right, everybody, thank you for watching, and I will see you next time. God bless you. Bye.